Yes, uh, I think we are live now. Uh, welcome to the Romanian Cafe online, Cafe Naua Romanesco online, Bay Cafe Romani online, on the Facebook page of the Romanian Cultural Institute. Um, if uh, you participated to previous um, Romanian Cafe events, you already know that uh, we are uh, organizing every week um, conferences on Zoom um, with uh, people, lecturers invited to join us, uh, interesting subjects. And um, today we have uh, as well a very interesting and important subject. We are marking today the uh, 76th um, years since the deportation of Jews from Maramuresh region uh, and from Northern Transylvania. We are organizing this online conference entitled Memory and Historical Aspects on the Holocaust in Romania. And we have uh, three lecturers invited. Um, one of them is uh, is uh, Pnina Zilberman, who uh, is um, with us from her home in Tel Aviv, but she is uh, working uh, in Romania. Uh, she is the president and the founder of uh, Tarbut Foundation, which is uh, active and working in Siget, in uh, the town of Siget, in Maramuresh. Northern Transylvania. Uh, she and her uh, organization is uh, working in order to preserve the memory of the approximately 40,000 Jews who lived in Maramuresh region before the Holocaust. Another uh, um, lecturer, uh, Professor Rafael Vago is with us, who is um, uh, for, uh, representing uh, the um, history department of Tel Aviv University, and uh, he is also uh, was member of the Elie Wiesel um, Commission in Romania, uh, which was working uh, um, uh, established in the years 2000, 2004, if I'm not wrong, and uh, worked worked for, uh, for the official recognition of the Holocaust in Romania. He has a doctorate in Romanian-Hungarian relations. Uh, his research interest includes the Holocaust and modern forms of anti-Semitism, minorities in Europe, post-communist post systems, European integration, and minorities in Europe. Uh, he's also uh, very important uh, to know that he's also a working um, member of the organization of uh, Israelis of Romanian origin, Amir, and he is uh, working and responsible for the um, content, the academic scientific content of the future museum of the Romanian Jews in Roshpina. The third uh, lecturer is Professor Dan Michman. He is not yet with us. He will join us a little bit later during this uh, conference and uh, I will present him as soon as he will be available. Uh, he is uh, working uh, in um, the Yad Vashem Institute for Holocaust, so uh, he represents a very prestigious institution. We will have him later. Uh, now I am um, inviting uh, Pnina Zilberman, who is uh, supposed to uh, leave us in uh, uh, 20 minutes, I, I think. So uh, she will be the first speaker before uh, uh, she will leave us. And um, Pnina, please uh, tell us about your work. Uh, tell us a little bit about the history of the Maramuresh and Siget uh, Jews. Uh, we know 
pr probably all everybody who is listening to us knows that Eli Wiesel was also born in Siget. Um, me myself has have uh, uh, roots from there, from uh, Maramures, from Siget, from uh, the neighborhood. So uh, I'm personally interested on what you are going to tell us. Welcome. Nina Zilberman to the Romanian Cafe uh, of Icere Tel Aviv. Thank you very much. And um, I would like, it. I'm so happy that you are a landsman. In Yiddish means a very close friend. So um, what I'm about to talk about is uh, what does it mean to be a second generation? Uh, not really the history. I'm not a historian, although I know the history very well of the place, but um, I think that it's extremely important uh, to know some things about second generation, uh, which means the children of. So I'm a daughter of uh, two survivors, one from Seaget, my mother, and my father from Bucharest. And uh, soon you are going to see, here is the picture of the family, uh, Walter. This is grandpa, Ephraim in Hebrew, Ferenc in Hungarian, Perla, which I am named after in Hebrew, Pnina. And um, that's the uh, Yosef. This is Nachman. This is my mother, Shari, or Sarah, and uh, the other little girl, Tamar, or Aggie. The other four boys, I know the names, but I don't know which name goes with who. Um, so uh, that's the situation. May all of them rest in peace. We can keep this picture on. I would like to read you a poem now that was written by an Israeli poetess by the name of Zelda. She was religious and she based this poem on a drash from the Talmud. In the Talmud it says that a parent gives the name of a child. Uh, in the Ashkenazi movement, it's uh, named in memory of somebody. And most of us children of Holocaust survivors were given names in memory of someone, uh, a member of the family that um, was murdered, killed, starved, or any other way. So we carry a certain energy, a certain history by carrying the name. So I am named after Perla. Her last name was Huber. Uh, she came from a little village around uh, the around Seaget and grandpa came from Seaget. So um, I would read now the poem. Each of us has a name. Each of us has a name given by God and given by our parents. Each of us has a name given by our stature and our smile and given by what we wear. Each of us has a name given by the mountains and given by our walls. Each of us has a name given by the stars and given by our neighbors. Each of us has a name given by our sins and given by our longings. Each of us has a name given by our enemies and given by our love. Each of us has a name given by our celebrations and given by our work. Each of us has a name given by the seasons and given by our blindness. Each of us has a name given by the sea and given by our death. So from the Walter family, uh, three people survived and now all of them are gone. So survived Nachman, Shari, and Agi. Joseph, unfortunately, was already, that's a good part, he was already a lawyer 
And apparently somebody said that he was spreading some leaflets as a communist, so they sent him to hard labor camp and he never came back. Uh, and the rest, my mother, sister, and the four boys and the parents were deported on the 18 of May, 1944. And uh, the parents and the four boys were right away taken, uh, most likely to be killed. And my mother and Aggie were taken for work and they went through the whole process. Sending to... Now, as I started to say, uh, I am a daughter of Holocaust survivors, and I had a, I created a specific motto in my life that led me to study the periods, to study, to research, to teach, and especially to be around survivors. Since I was a child, I was always around survivors. My wish was all my life to empower the future Holocaust generations to be free of any victimization syndrome. There is the syndrome of victimization. I personally am very much against it. On the contrary, ladies and gentlemen, we are winners. Our parents' survival made us winners. We brought up our families and the Jewish people had the continuation. Most of the survivors got married right away, not necessarily great marriages the rest of their lives, but the bottom line was that they wanted the continuation of the Jewish people. Therefore, we can say nice and loud, Am Israel Chai. Another important thing to keep in mind, our parents did not go as lamb to the slaughter. When they came to Israel, the survivors, the, tzab, the people who were born here were saying to them, you walked like lamb to the slaughter. On the contrary, there was great resistance right, right there in front of the Nazis' eyes. Now, resistance has many formats, and right away we can think of the physical one, which is correct. Now, I'm going to list here just a few um, cases of resistance. Number one, Sobibor camp on October 14, 1943, the uprising there. October 1944, Auschwitz II, Crematorium 4, uprising with the assistance of three brave women for over six months carried on their own bodies gunpowder providing the Sondro Commando to uh, use it in order to blow up the crematorium, which by the way, the Nazis never redid it or refurnished it. The Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, which took almost a month, April 19 to May 16, 1943. Personally, I was honored to have in junior high, a teacher who, had, who participated in the uprising of the Warsaw Ghetto. And at the time he was 16 years old. We shouldn't forget Hannah Senesh, who was born in Budapest. She made Aliyah. She was trained as a parachutist infiltrated in the former Yugoslavia, and moved then to Budapest, but unfortunately was caught, taken on a mock trial, and killed. She was a heroine, only 23 years old. And as we said, we shall never forget, and we must remember the many, many partisans, men and women who fought against the Nazis in other ways. So there, I just gave you a few examples of physical resistance. So we have to be proud and we have to remember that our parents did not go a slaughter, as lamb to the slaughter. 
Now I'm going to move to another kind of resistance, spiritual resistance, which is the actual state that saved many, many survivors from dying. For example, what does um, spiritual resistance mean? Writing diaries, the very famous Anne Frank diary, or Yosele, less known of a religious boy. And for us, that we come from North Transylvania, we have Eva, who wrote also a diary. And today, when you go to Oradia, in one of the parks, there is her statue there. Poems written, I never saw another butterfly from the Terezin camp in the former Czechoslovakia. Music, which was composed during the internship at various camps. Paintings and sketches that were painted with the chip of a pencil or a small piece of charcoal, charcoal on a very small piece of paper. But all these things were part of the spiritual resistance. Where are all the rabbis who recited the prayers off by heart? and other biblical chapters. All of the above is considered gvura, heroism. These were acts of heroism. We should know and be proud of these deeds. Walk proudly with our chin up. I'm sure most of you have heard of Dr. Viktor Frankl, the psychiatrist and neurologist born in Vienna who arrived with his dear wife to Auschwitz was separated, and unfortunately, his wife was murdered quiet right away as they arrived. But he did not find out only after liberation. However, during this time of separation between the two of them, he hoped and trusted that she is alive. He would walk, talk to her, supposedly. He would make plans about having children, where they're going to live, where they're going to travel, and so on. This is what kept him going. In addition, he used to recite many pages of books he read many times, and he knew them off by heart. Once upon a time, we students used to get everything to do off by heart. I recall during my tenure as the director of the Holocaust Museum in Toronto, meeting Goethe Wiseman Klein, Polish survivor, author, and human rights activist, lives in Texas. She's still alive, 93 years old. When she was asked by the audience after she gave a presentation, what helped her to survive? She said very simply, I designed in my mind the dresses I would wear when the war will be over for the various happy occasions I will attend. What's important to remember about Dr. Frankel is the fact following liberation, he developed a method known, a therapy method known as the logotherapy. Among the many books he wrote, is the most famous one, Men in Search of Meaning, which is the most applicable for us, children of, Holo of Holocaust survivors. Again, going against the victimization, finding meaning, finding a purpose. You see, my friends, each one of us has a mission and meaning during their life since birth. The issue is to find the meaning in life. And it's not easy, I know. Once I personally recognized, based on my parents' survival, that I am the triumph of my parents, I looked for the meaning. And actually, I found the meaning in the topic or in the word Holocaust. As I mentioned before, I studied, I gained knowledge, and I moved forward with the line, how am I going to make a difference in a positive way? I recall I just arrived in Canada in 1969. I started to 
to write a children's Holocaust bibliography. In 69, there weren't too many books, but this is what I wanted to do. However, later on, that developed into a major subject. I was always attracted to survivor stories, starting with my late grandmother of blessed memory on my father's side, the one that came from Bucharest. Uh, she told me all about the Romanian Jewish history before the war and following until they moved to Israel in 1948. As a Jewish educator, I always made sure the schools observed Yom HaShoah Ve'agvura wherever I taught or I directed. It wasn't so popular uh, back in the 60s. It just took a while when I came to Canada. Canada was still very, um, very English, shall I say. People didn't wear kippot on the streets and things like that. That started only later on in the 80s, 90s. The major opportunity, back to my story, that came, in my, that came my way was my appointment to be the director of the Holocaust Museum in Toronto. There I felt I was ready to make a major difference, difference in the hearts of non-Jewish students and the community at large. One major example, that the Toronto City Hall adopted about 25 years ago. They proclaimed Holocaust Education Week and that takes place every year during the first week in November. But I didn't stop here. The most important meaning for me is the personal one when I established in 2014 Fundacja Tarbut Siget Kultura și Educacje in Judaica. The word tarbut in Hebrew means culture. So I established this foundation um, that all programs are cultural ones. Since the Jews of Maramuresh were highly cultural, they had a theater. Shall I mention the little people from Rosavlia, which is about 30 kilometers just outside of Siget. They would travel across Europe were in great demand, all of them survived, and nevertheless, they were part of the uh, little people uh, that uh, Dr. Mengele, Marchimo, wanted to um, do all his experiments on them. Um, so we had the theater, we had Jewish bands, professional chazanim, cantors, who would travel across Europe at a very largest concert halls to sing, and all of them came from Siget. Uh, printing houses that would print manuscripts sent from United States, mainly from New York, to be printed in Siget and then shipped back to New York. The foundation was founded in memory of my late mother's family, Walter, and for all the Siget Jews, who were killed, murdered, starved, and who knows how else they died. Since its launch, Tarbut Foundation have reached thousands of non-Jewish high school students across Northern Transylvania. We travel to Bayamare, Satumare, Cluj, Oradia. We went to Timisoara, Arad, all of those cities. In addition, in Bucharest as well at the capital. Um, the community at large as well. In our concerts, we usually have the community at large. Um, the many cultural events and programs we organize at the libraries, concert halls, synagogues, school auditoriums, museums, etc. Now, I've just told you what we do for non-Jews. Now I'm going to tell you what we do for the Jewish community. Not necessarily the local Romanian ones, but the international one. As for the Jewish descendants from the region, Tarbut offers genealogical research, family roots journeys, international gatherings to commemorate the period of the deportations 
May 16 to the 22nd, 1944. As to date, we had four gatherings. The first one in 2014, when we observed the 70th anniversary, 2015, 2017, and last year. And we look forward to the 80th, which is not too far away. Uh, God's willing, it's going to be 2024. I would like to conclude and say that we all find meaning in these unusual and painful historical events our families went through. As much as the famous sayings go, never again, we remember, memory and memorial are extremely important words but also we need to take action. As to speak about what's happening today in our lives, I hope that we are almost over the COVID-19. I'm usually in Romania during this time, at the schools, organizing cultural programs for the summer and fall. However, this year I'm here in Israel and you're probably wondering, so what is she doing? Well, I was under lockdown because I'm considered risky uh, person because of the age. So right away, as of the 10th of March, I decided I'm going to write the family story. I therefore challenge every second, third, fourth generation that is listening here or listens at their own time to start to write your family story and history. All what you know, you'll be surprised how much material and how much information you know. And if you don't, there are so many sources these days that you can gather and complete the information, as well as use the many pages of Facebook that are available on the net. There is the Yad Vashem, there is Jewish Gen. I don't want to list here everything, but many, many more. And of course, you can always contact us at our booth. The picture that you see here, just before I end, the picture that you see here is a very important picture. If you've been to Seagate, you must have passed by. On the ground of this monument was the most important Orthodox synagogue of the Teitelbaum dynasty who we know in Israel much more about the Satmar dynasty, but these two, one the dynasty of uh, Satmar comes out of the dynasty of uh, Teitelbaum from Siget. This was the largest synagogue. The synagogue was set on fire. There are various interpretations. The bottom line was that it was set on fire with the ritual books and with some people inside. Following coming back from liberation, about 2,000 Jews came back, mainly from Auschwitz. Um, uh, no, sorry. Uh, mainly those that were deported to Auschwitz, but uh, mainly they came back uh, from uh, Bergen-Belsen. That's where many of them were uh, taken on the death marches at the end of uh, January before the Russians liberated Auschwitz and requested in 1948 from the local Communist Party that they would like to build here a monument. And so they did, and the gate and these poles are the original ones from the synagogue because we have pictures how the synagogue looked, so we are matching it. And all the um, memorials that take place 
regarding Jewish life in Seged are taking place here. This is a historical site. Uh, as per EU laws, nothing can be moved. It has to stay like this. So I just wanted to show you, this is the memorial for all the Jews that were in Seged. In 1944, just before deportations, were about 17,000 and a half Jews, which almost half of the total population. That gives you an idea how important and how um, active they were. I thank you very much for this part. And um, actually I'm on my way to the Mara Moorish Israeli organization that is starting pretty soon their yearly uh, memorial commemoration service. Uh, before uh, Professor Rafael Vago continues, we have a little bit of an interlude which you will see some animations. Um, we just talked, I just started to talk to you about the uh, deportations of the Mara Moorish or North Transylvania. There was another piece of land uh, in the north part of um, Romania that were also deported the Jews. That area region was called Bukovina. And one of the projects of Tarbut is to take books that were written in English or in Hebrew and translate them into Romanian. And last year we launched also uh, the ICR in Tel Aviv and also in Bucharest, this book that was written uh, by Dr. Felicia Carmeli, who just passed away a couple of months ago. And, um, she was born in Vatradorne, which is in the beginning of the Bukovina region. And um, at the age of nine years old, she was deported to a series. At a, the place is called Transnistria, but that was a place with a series of camps. Um, so what you're going to see the animation is an interpretation, a brief interpretation of her uh, life story. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pnina. After three grueling days, we reached a little town on the shore of the river Dinester, called the Taxi. We were told that we would remain there for a few days. Once a thriving Jewish town, a Taxi was bombed out and in total ruins. Not a single resident who had lived there before the war could be found. The soldiers led us out of the train and ordered us to go out and seek shelter, wherever we could find it. In one of the houses, we found two rooms where the ceilings were relatively intact to shelter us from the freezing rain and snow. The next day, my mother decided to take me to the river to clean up after our hellish three days journey. In her mind, it was a bigger risk to go on so filthy than to be caught by the soldiers guarding us. I was looking forward to feeling clean once again. We went to the river very early in the morning, hoping the soldiers would still be asleep. It was barely light outside. When we got to the water, we were horrified by the gruesome sight that we encountered. Dead bodies and limbs of people and horses and torn up bloody Jewish prayer books and Torah scrolls were scattered all over. Mother somehow mustered up the strength to wash herself and me despite this. On our way back to where the rest of the family was, the soldiers spotted us and started shooting. We both fell to the ground and began crawling, my mother on top of me so the bullets wouldn't hit me. We managed to stumble into a dark cave to hide. After our eyes adapted to the darkness, we saw some writing on the walls in Hebrew. Painted in blood on the stone walls 
The writing said, please say Kaddish for the many people who were murdered here. Thank you very much, uh, Pnina. I think she already left to this uh, event, commemoration event that she is uh, part of. Uh, I think uh, Pnina Zilberman is doing a very important uh, activity, very important job there in uh, Siget, uh, community work. This is what she does there, and uh, it's absolutely, um, how to say, honorable job to, 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 to give up on your life in Israel and to move for several months to Romania, to Siget, and cherish your ancestors' memory and try to um, keep alive the memory of Holocaust in, in Romania, in Siget. A broader image of, uh, of the whole story we will get from to uh, historians, I say, and researchers, I say too, because uh, we have now uh, uh, Dr. Michman, Professor Michman, together with us. Uh, welcome, Professor Michman. Glad to have you um, uh, with us. And uh, we are um, hardly wait to listen to your uh, lecture which will be about uh, the open ghettos in Romania, uh, the complexities of history, memory, and compensation. Uh, but before that, I, uh, I will uh, leave the floor to Professor Rafael Vago, uh, professor at the Tel Aviv University, as I said, and a member of the Elie Wiesel Commission in Romania for the official recognition of, uh, of the Holocaust. Uh, his field of research, as we already said, is the Northern Transylvanian Holocaust and the Hungarian, Hungar the faith of the Hungarian uh, Jews or the Jews who were, uh, who perished uh, under uh, Hungarian rule in the Second World War. Professor Vago, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I am very glad to participate in this uh, coffee, Romanian coffee, which I already participated several times, and it seems to me always very successful. Uh, let me present, try to present briefly a historical background to what we are discussing now. In August 1940, Northern Transylvania, and I think that we have a map that we can see for a few moments. Northern Transylvania was given back to Hungary in what's called the Second Vienna Award, or what is also called the Vienna Diktat. We can see in the map that it was a territory that was annexed from Romania in 1940. We can see in the north, Siget, Sigetul uh, Marmatsie is Siget, as Plina talked about, uh, as uh, the director of the ICI, uh, Ichere mentioned he has some roots in Siget. I have also, my late father was born there in 1922, but moved away a couple of years later to another place in Northern Transylvania. In this area of Northern Transylvania, that was given from Romania to Hungary in 1940, there were about 165,000 Jews. Uh, we can take off now the map. Uh, you can imagine uh, on the territory, there were about 165,000 Jews in Northern Transylvania under Hungarian rule between 1940 and 1944. About 132,000 of them were deported from the ghetto areas, from ghettos in the, from the beginning of May. So we are commemorating, as you have mentioned, Mr. Director, 
the 76th anniversary of the deport ghettoization and the deportations. So out of 165,000 Jews in Northern Transylvania, some 131, 132,000s were deported. Out of them, the total number of victims, and we shall perhaps never know, I hope that yes, but we never, we do not know the exact numbers. There were about between 100,000 and 120,000 victims. So if we take the number of about 110,000 victims, out of 132,000 who were deported, 110,000 perished. Now, before going on with the historical narrative of what happened in Northern Transylvania, let me jump to another uh, framework, another part of our discussion. The timetable between the tragedy of the Jews in Romania proper was different from that of Northern Transylvania under Hungarian rule. In what sense? The tragedy in Romania began in 1940, 1941, and with the pogroms in not only in Bucharest, but in Yash in late June 1941, before that in Dorohoi, and again in Dorohoi, and the deportations to Transnistria, as Plina has mentioned. By 90, late 1943, that part of the Holocaust in Romania, in Transnistria, was over, and the Jews started deportees, started to return. Yet, on the other hand, over the border, Northern Transylvania, the former Romanian territory that was now under Hungarian rule, the real tragedy started only after March 1944. And in fact, during May, April, May 1944, many Jews from Northern Transylvania tried to escape to Romania where the situation was, of course, much safer. I should mention in this context, uh, the very interesting activities of Dr. Wilhelm Fildermann, the leader of Romanian Jewish community, who wrote a memorandum among dozens and hundreds of others to the Romanian leadership in late May 1944, when he found out what is happening in the Hungarian territory of Northern Transylvania. And he appealed to the Romanian government to allow refugees arriving over the border and allowing them to enter. And he wrote very interestingly in his argument, so you can see the difference between Romania in, and Hungary in 1944, Fildenman wrote that those refugees, there are, they were Romanian citizens. So please note that between, between the two world wars, the Jews of Northern Transylvania were Romanian citizens. And now, in May 1944, Fildermann writes that there were Romanian citizens who behaved in a very well matter in those territories, and they had excellent relations with the local Romanian population, population and he appealed to the Romanian government that they would give asylum to those Jews who can flee, who are succeeding in crossing the border, because some of them, or many of them, were returned in the beginning by the Romanian authorities to the Hungarian side where probably they were executed. So we can see here the different timetables and the connections because I should mention also that Fuderman and other Romanian leaders were appealing to world public opinion in May 1944 while Romania was already about to liberate it by the advancing Red Army about the fate of the Jews in Northern Transylvania. Now let me return generally to the picture in Northern Transylvania. We can see that after the German occupation of Hungary on the 19th of March, 1944, the immediate action and collaboration, cooperation of the Hungarian authorities with the Nazi authorities led by Eichmann to the final solution of evacuating, deporting the Jews of Northern Transylvania. And for that matter of Hungary of the whole, outside perhaps Budapest, which remained more or less intact. The first deportations or the first ghettoization rather started in Northern Transylvania on the 3rd of May, 1944. And we can see here four stages, four stages in what was happening to the Jews. We can see four uh, stages of what was happening to the Jews in Northern Transylvania. The first stage was the rounding up 
of the Jews, starting from the 3rd of May, the ghettoization, the second stage. The third stage, the concentration of the Jews in major ghettos, and finally the deportation. If we look at the background of what was on these four stages, which was also mentioned by the Wiesel Commission in, 1940, in 2003, 2004, chapter of the final report of the commission written by the late Professor Braham or a working group under his, the leadership of Professor Randolph Braham, where he mentioned the total cooperation of the Hungarian authorities and most of the Hungarian local population with those steps taken against uh, the Jews. Now in these four stages of the rounding up, which was a very fast procedure because already in late, in uh, beginning of June, late May, beginning of June, we see the beginning of the deportations. Uh, Prina is now participating, Prina Zilberman is participating on a memorial service or memorial uh, gathering to the Jews from uh, Siget, which started to be deported from the 22nd of May, exactly we're speaking about these days, 76 uh, years ago. I should mention, it's very important to mention, the terrible conditions in which the Jews in Northern Transylvania under the Hungarian rule were rounded up, gathered into ghettos in terrible conditions, and then concentrated in the larger ghettos of Transylvania, like Cluj, Oradea, Tirgumuresh, Maros Pasharta in Hungarian, Siget, and, and several other major places, where the ghetto of Cluj was one of the largest, and perhaps Oradea, Nagyvarod, Nod, was the largest uh, ghetto. A terrible part of those aspects, of those gathering of the Jews in the ghettos, was the search the terrible search among the Jews for the valuables where they were hiding their property or money. And many of Jews or many of the Jews committed suicide or became almost mad after those terrible searches that the German, the Hungarian authorities, not the German ones, committed. Here we should mention the active participation, which I hinted already, of the Hungarian gendarmerie Transylvania was divided into several operational zones of gendarmerie in which according to a, what I could call a master plan, and this is also the term used by, I'm using actually the term used by Professor Landorf Braham, we can speak about a master plan exactly how to carry out district by district in what phase the deportations. The actual phase of the deportations was carried out in cooperation with the German authorities. And the, those 131,000 Jews who were deported from Northern Transylvania were taken in 45 trains in the transports to the extermination camp, especially to Auschwitz. In the ghettos, and the, we should remember that most of the Jews or most of the ghettos in Northern Transylvania unlike what we know about it in Poland, were very short-lived. Actually, they were transfer camps until the transition camps, until being deported. Inside the ghettos, as I have mentioned, the conditions were terrible. In each ghetto, there was a Jewish council, a Judenrat, a, where the authorities had to comply with the Hungarian uh, authorities. A major question to which our discussion does not allow us from the point of view of time, when the local leaders, especially in Cluj, in the beginning of May, around the 7th and 10th of May, the, how much the local Judenrat people, the leaders, knew about their fate once they would be deported, what did they do with the knowledge that they had, how the Jews behaved, how they felt about it, what they thought. And these are very, very difficult questions, which until now are a major part of the historiography of the Holocaust. Another aspect that I would like to uh, mention is that the, after the war, after the Second World War, when the territory 
from October 1944, with the advancement of the Red Army and the Romanian Army, the territory was liberated. The Romanian courts started to prosecute those who were guilty in the deportations and the ghettoization and the deportation of the Jews of Northern uh, Transylvania. We know from those trials, in spite of the many accusations in our days by Holocaust deniers and revisionists, that do, do, those courts were manipulated by the communists and so on. What is very important, and that also our commission, the visa commission based on these reports from the courts, in the people's courts as they were called, after in 1945-46, about what was happening in Northern uh, Transylvania. Actually, we can speak that besides the thousands of young men, including my late father, who were in the compulsory Hungarian labor battalions, were actually slaves to the Hungarian army, which who are not deported, but used by the Hungarian uh, forces, and except some other exemptions, most of the Jews, as I mentioned, about 131,000 were deported by the Hungarians with the full cooperation of their authorities with the German uh, authorities. Today, and we, our discussion also covers the memory, and with this I am going to uh, conclude, uh, there are many commemorations inside Transylvania, like inside the other parts of Romania about the Holocaust, uh, teachers from Romania are participating in seminars in Yad Vashem yearly about the Holocaust in Romania, which in my le lectures, at least in my presentations, I emphasize also the fate of the uh, Jews of Northern Hungary. I should mention, and it was understood from my, what I have spoken until now, that the final commission, the commission of the, on the Holocaust in Romania, in its final report, the, in the Wiesel Commission, there is a chapter on Northern Transylvania. While they are part of the Holocaust of the Hungarian Jewry, they were, as Fildermann correctly said in his memorandum of the 26th of May, 1944, actually Romanian citizens who between the two wars were loyal citizens to Romania, like my parents who studied in Romanian schools between the two wars in Northern uh, Transylvania. So justly, the fate of the Northern Transylvanian Jews under Hungarian rule and part of the Holocaust in Hungary actually is a part of the Holocaust of Romania, but not on Romanian territory because of that part being part of Romania between the two world wars and of course, since the second world war. I would like to conclude in this part of my presentation. And I think there will be some remarks or questions. We have some minutes at the end of our discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Vago. Yes, um, indeed, very interesting uh, situation. What happened with the Northern Transylvanian Jews who were used to be Romanian citizens between the two world wars, became uh, Hungarian citizens. Um, few of them or many of them were, were um, happy of this uh, change of uh, regime, uh, but uh, the ir irony of faith was that uh, the Hungarian rule wasn't favorable for them. This is what killed them, and um, um, it's always uh, history makes uh, uh, ugly, ugly jokes and tricks on, on people. Uh, yes, indeed, you have you have already a few questions and uh, comments. Uh, I uh, I think it's better to leave it for the end of the presentation to give now the floor to Professor Michman. Uh, as I said, uh, Professor Dan Michman is the head of the International <coughs> Holocaust Research Institute and the chair of the Holocaust Study Department. He is also an emeritus professor of modern Jewish history and chair of the Arnold and Leona Finkler Institute of Holocaust Research. His uh, PhD uh, is about Jewish refugees from Germany in the Netherlands, 1933-1940. 
he published num uh, uh, huge number of, of books, volumes and articles in a variety of languages uh, about uh, the Holocaust, the history of ghettos. Uh, and uh, for, for the Romanian Holocaust, his work is uh, relevant also because he um, uh, made research on, on the topic of ghettos, open ghettos in Romania complexities of history, memory, and compensation. This is the topic of today's presentation. Uh, Professor Michman de Vakasha, thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you. Uh, and I'm glad to join this, uh, this forum uh, with uh, my good friend uh, Rafi Vago. And also interestingly with uh, Penina uh, Zilberman, uh, whom I met for last time in uh, 1991 in Toronto uh, in a Holocaust Education Week, which she <laughs> mentioned. But since then, we haven't uh, met each other. Um, so I'm, I'm not an historian of, uh, uh, of Romanian history as, as such. Uh, through my knowledge of French, I can understand Romanian which is a good help for this purpose, but uh, my research did not focus uh, on Romania as such. It is included in some uh, of my uh, studies, uh, and the, the thing that I want to talk about today has to do with my position as uh, head of the Yad Vashem uh, Research in I Institute. And I'll tell a little bit about uh, uh, the history of uh, the top of the topic and what happened, and that is that uh, several years ago, uh, Germany uh, decided uh, to broaden the scope of compensation uh, within the framework of what uh, they call the ghetto, the ghetto law of, the, of people who carried out uh, forced labor or even just labor in uh, in ghettos and um, they uh, step they base themselves actually on a certain uh, understanding of what a ghetto is uh, and when they came and uh, in this broadening of uh, the uh, the readiness to compensate, they included also countries under the influence of Germany, not on only uh, occupied and controlled by Germany, but also under the influence. And this, uh, of course, started to include also uh, Bulgaria and Romania. And applications for compensation came in to the uh, German finance uh, ministry. Um, and uh, around uh, these issues, also a uh, negotiations started between Israel uh, and uh, and, Ger and Germany, but uh, it uh, arrived at a point of deadlock of uh, what is what are ghettos and actually open ghettos in Romania, uh, which now brings me back uh, to. Uh, my personal research also, um, at a certain moment, the uh, German uh, Ministry of Finance uh, approached us at Yad Vashem to help them uh, get to, to get out from this, uh, from this deadlock. And it had also to do with my personal research because uh, it's, uh, about a, 11 years ago, uh, Yad Vashem published a, an encyclopedia of ghettos. And also the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum published a, an encyclopedia of camps and ghettos and the part of the ghettos uh, has been completed. In the meantime, the part on the camps, not yet, not yet uh, entirely. Uh, and we have different opinions. So the encyclopedias, the, the two encyclopedias uh, have different definitions of 
what ghettos are. And I wrote an introduction to our encyclopedia. And from that uh, introduction, also a much larger uh, book uh, emerged. Uh, and what I found actually that the Germans never, never uh, really defined uh, what a ghetto is. The ghetto is a historical term which uh, originates in v uh, Venice in 1516 and is then uh, taken over to other places. And when the real ghettos were abolished, the term continued to exist and to be used uh, in a metaphorical way on the one hand of isolation and segregation, but also in a more uh, concrete uh, meaning, and that is a, a densely populated poor J Jewish neighborhood. And in this way, it is used in 19th century literature and discourse, and also in the beginning of the 20th century, both in Jewish circles and in non-Jewish non uh, uh, circles. And in the metaphorical meaning, it uh, enters uh, the period of the Nazi rule. Already in the 1930s, German Jews, uh, when they relate to the segregation, they speak about being in a kind of a ghetto. There were no ghettos at the time. and uh, But that is how they talked. And later on, the, the, the term is taken over also by the Nazi authorities. And uh, actually, in the beginning, they are against ghettos. But when they uh, conquer Poland in 1939, they bump into uh, many places where you have densely populated uh, poor Jewish neighborhoods in Poland, and they speak about the ghettos. So the term is used, is, is used, and then later on, ghettos, uh, closed ghettos were established or these neighborhoods were closed or sometimes they were open, but people were restricted to live in them. So there was no wall or barbed wire, but people were restricted to, the, the, to those uh, places. And because of the fact that um, Holocaust historiography started in the 1940s, immediately in the post-war period, uh, mostly by uh, Polish Jewish historians, the Polish understanding of what a ghetto is uh, became uh, entrenched in, in scholarship. And it was even uh, strengthened by a very influential book by the uh, American uh, Jewish scholar Raoul Hilberg, and uh, in his book, The Destruction of the European Jews, which was published uh, first in 1961. And for him, uh, ghettoization is identical with concentration. And a ghetto has a certain form with it is barbed wire or wall and so on, or there are open ghettos, but the example is actually, or the image is actually what uh, uh, happened in Poland. And on the basis of these early understandings, also the, the definition of uh, and the way it was applied by the German authorities uh, in the process of compensation throughout the years uh, was applied. Now, uh, what happened later on in, the, in, the, in this millennium already, that a lot of applications were turned uh, down by uh, German officials because uh, when people talked about the place uh, where they were, it didn't exactly fill or, or uh, meet the standards of this original understanding. I even had a personal experience where in my book, which was published in 2011, I, I write, uh, I can even show the, the English and the German version, here they are, right? I write that in, in Amsterdam, the place where I was born, there was no ghetto. <laughs> and uh, there were people who applied from Amsterdam for compensation and they were turned down on the basis of my book. So they, they asked me to help them and I helped them by saying that my book was not published uh, when uh, the German law came into force and they based themselves on Hilberg, so they should proceed with, with Hilberg. But later on, and now we got 
uh, even more problems. I, I would like to add one thing also that when we look into uh, contemporary documentation from the Holocaust period, and later also into uh, scholarship, we can see that uh, there is a way Germans use the word uh, ghetto. There is a different way that you, Jews use the term ghetto. And there is a way scholars use the term ghetto, right? So scholars often uh, call every concentration of Jews a ghetto. But Jews uh, at the time related in one way. For instance, we have places like Krakow in Poland where uh, the term <laughs> where there was a ghetto, a closed ghetto. Then people were deported from them except for a limited number of people who were kept for forced labor. And from that moment on, the Germans call it a Zwangsarbeitlager, that is forced labor camp. But the Jews call it the little ghetto because it is still part of the former ghetto. So we have all kinds of different understanding. Now, uh, getting back to the negotiations between Israel and, uh, and uh, Germany over applications of people from Romani Romania having been in open ghettos, they got to a deadlock. Uh, because there was no clear understanding what open ghettos in Romania, and I mean old Romania, not Transnistria, right? Transnistria, it is uh, a little bit clearer, but complicated. Uh, I may read, there is this uh, well-known, um, the well-known order uh, from uh, order num number one uh, uh, of the Romanian army uh, from August 1941. Uh, it's in Romanian, German, and Russian. It says the Jews will live only in ghettos, colonies, and labor camps. So we have in one breath colonies, labor camps, and ghettos, and it is not clear in the Romanian discourse what exactly is a ghetto or a labor camp. And we have, I even found a, um, a, a correspondence between a, a non-Jewish husband and his Jewish wife, uh, who, and the Jewish wife was sent to Transnistria, and they correspond, and he speaks about the camp ghetto. So the camp that is called ghetto. So it is not entirely clear, but still regarding Transnistria, we have those concentrations of people who were deported there. And it is um, accepted that we can call them ghettos. But in the other uh, parts of Romania, uh, there, was a pro there is a problem. So they approached us and um, uh, also because a, as uh, Professor Vago very well knows uh, that there is a lot of research on Transnistria. There is research about the general picture, but on the local level about many places, uh, the uh, state of research is, is still very uh, restricted. And uh, uh, there is a little documentation that is waiting for scholars to, uh, to deal with. And um, then the question arose, uh, in order to uh, materialize compensation, and the German authorities are interested in compensating these people, but they have to overcome the legal problem of what a Roman, a Romanian open ghetto is. Uh, they asked us to help them. And uh, what uh, we did it with our team at Yad Vashem, and I personally, um, I consulted uh, Dr. Radu Yoannid, who is now the new ambassador here, but is of course, uh, if not uh, uh, the leading, definitely a leading scholar uh, uh, globally on, on, on Romania. And we uh, discussed together how uh, can we uh, understand what are the few features of uh, what can be called an open ghetto in, 
in Romania. The, this happened a year, uh, a year ago, a year and uh, four months ago. Uh, one of the problems was that it happened in January uh, 2019, and for uh, Dr. Yo uh, Ioannid, it was a problem as a state employee in uh, the United States, there was uh, there was no budget, and he was not allowed officially to work. So we had to do it on the telephone. He was not allowed to write emails, uh, and uh, but we uh, managed to have a, a definition uh, with six points, which uh, talked about uh, restriction of movement, expulsion, and concentration. Um, and uh, then um, leaders held hostage, forced labor, visual segregation, and limitations on food. Six parameters uh, for what uh, can be called an open ghetto. Not all features have to be existent in every case, but the majority uh, of them. And uh, then uh, after we submitted uh, this uh, to the uh, uh, German Ministry of Finance, they uh, requested uh, a, uh, a study and a very quick study within several weeks uh, regarding a list of places uh, that they uh, sent us and the state and the places uh, were Yash, Botoshan, Targumores, which is in the, was in Hungary, but so Galatz, Fokshan, Tekuch, Roman, uh, Piatra Neamts, Barlad, Vaslui, uh, Area Julia, Constanz, uh, Targu Neamt, Harlau, Buzau, uh, Ramnichu Sarat, uh, Stefanest, Krajova, Paskan, and Baskau. I hope that I pronounced it well in Romanian, but these were the places and we checked we check them. Uh, and altogether, we came to a, a conclusion uh, that all these places uh, can be called open ghettos. And this opened the way uh, to uh, conclude the negotiations and to have these people uh, compensated retroactively. And now also we are beginning a second batch. The German ministry approached us to, uh, to uh, deal uh, with uh, some 20 more places. Uh, the interesting thing is that I just this morning uh, got a, uh, a notification by uh, a, the colleague who is the expert in the Israeli uh, Ministry of uh, Social Equality uh, and who is uh, monitoring what is happening in Germany that just uh, the beginning of this week, uh, the Supreme uh, social court in Germany decided to adopt uh, our definition uh, in order to uh, broaden the scope of compensation for people not only in Romania but also in other places. They say in the past, in the past, it was assumed that there was a clear definition of ghetto. Research has shown that it is much more complicated. Therefore, for the purpose of compensation, uh, the, uh, the list of features of what ghettoization means uh, should be applied in the legal uh, process. So uh, from this perspective, uh, the problem that uh, was encountered regarding the applications of people from from Romania uh, is now the basis for a much lo uh, larger and broader approach of compensation by the German authorities and that is of course very important because we are now uh, speaking about a very old Holocaust survivors, even those who were kids during uh, World War II, are now elderly people, and uh, they need uh, they need the compensation and the assistance in their old days. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Professor Michman. Uh, really interesting and uh, and very useful uh, uh, information about uh, uh, practical 
uh, issues, practical uh, side of this uh, dilemma of what is uh, uh, definition of uh, ghetto and uh, how can it be translated in legal, juridical language. Uh, we have a lot of, of, of uh, questions uh, for both of uh, the historians. So I think uh, in order to save time, I will read all the questions for Mr. Professor Vago, uh, and he will try to remember <laughs> the questions. If you forget something, just ask me, and, and then we will pass to the floor to Professor Michman. So, uh, uh, Rafael Vago, question from Dan Romashkanu. Uh, is there a time frame for the opening to the public of the future Museum of the History of the Jews from Romania and Roshpina? We are hearing about it for at least 15 years. Okay, so maybe you're not uh, exactly the one who is supposed to answer to this practical part. Uh, but uh, as I said, uh, Professor um, Vago is uh, responsible for the for the uh, academic uh, um, scientific uh, uh, um, content of the future museum, but and not about the walls of the the building. Uh, another another uh, question from Miki Koren. Why Horty, Miklos Horty, was not considered a war criminal? <laughs> and one more for Professor Vago. About the Jews from Northern Transylvania, who most of them spoke Hungarian and adopted Hungarian culture. So how comes that the professor mentioned about the fidelity to Romania? Okay, well, uh, I, I made a comment already on this issue. Of course, uh, uh, the question of loyalty was very complicated for Jews passing from a country to another uh, during the, the, the decisions of move, moving, moving the borders in uh, Europe after the wars. Uh, and of course, the Hungarian uh, speaker Jews were uh, mostly happy about the, uh, the Vienna dictate, but uh, the irony, irony of fate uh, and uh, and of history is that this was their uh, death sentence. Uh, okay, I think this. Three questions are mainly the most important ones for Professor Vago, please. Yes, thank you for the questions. Uh, I would like to mention the, to answer one by one very briefly because uh, let's leave time also to Professor uh, Michman. Uh, first of all, I understand the, some of the frustration regarding for about 15 years, as the gentleman mentioned, opening of the museum. A museum takes a very long time to build I'm very much aware also of the physical part of building the museum. Uh, let's hope that within less than one and a half years, even one year, but I would say one and a half years, the museum will finally be opened. Just in a, in a parenthesis, I would like to mention that we have to think about how many financial, organizational, technical planning aspects are behind a museum. Besides the aspect that I am also very much involved in it, what type of content uh, will be. I would say, and I have visited together with Mr. Uh, Itzhak Buzi Herzog, the museum uh, some uh, two or three months ago, almost three months ago, it, has, it is advancing very rapidly. It has been slowed down, of course, by the recent, recent crisis, the present crisis of the corona. So let's hope that within one and a half years, the museum will be open. To the second question, why Horthy was not considered, Admiral Horthy, the regent, the ruler of Hungary, was not considered as a war criminal. He did appear, was, was called as a witness in one of the anti-Nazi, one of the trials, one of the Nazi criminals. It's a kind of enigma, even until today, why he was not considered a war criminal. Among the rumors that some historians are trying to find evidence, that Stalin himself 
decided or rather called on the allies not to prosecute Horthy as a war criminal. But I think the major factor was that Horthy conducted for a long time, and I am not denying the fact that he was a war criminal, he conducted long negotiations with the allies, especially with the British, of leaving the war, leaving Nazi Germany, and coming out on the side of the allies. And perhaps this factor brought about a less hostile allied attitude towards Horthy. It remains as a public question or a historian's question, professional question, did he deserve to be tried as a war criminal? Why he wasn't uh, tried? Ultimately, he died in 1957, more or less peacefully, I would say, in his bed in Portugal. To the third question about the uh, loyalty of the Jews of Northern Transylvania, you are very correct that they were Hungarian speaking, had Hungarian uh, culture, and as Mr. Solomon remarked, some of them in 1940, and it became a very tragic and ironical aspect of history, they welcomed even the return of the Hungarian forces in 1940. But at the same time, we do not have any evidence, as far as I know, that the Jews of Northern Transylvania, the Hungarian speaking Jews, did anything against the Romanian state during the, between the two world wars. Furthermore, and if we are using historical documents, it's very interesting that in his memorandum, Fildermann mentioned the loyalty of the Romanian, of the Hungarian Jews, or Hungarian speaking Jews in Northern Transylvania, being loyal to the Romanian, Romanian, loyal Romanian citizens in order to try to save them in May, June, 1944, when they were crossing the border into Romania. Now, I do not know if there was any research, any time, a kind of public opinion poll, how much or how the Romanian, uh, how the, those Hungarian speaking Jews in Transylvania related to the Romanian state or to the Romanian language or Romanian culture. Many of them attended, like my parents, Romanian school. They spoke Romanian perfectly, yet at home they spoke Hungarian and were attached to the Hungarian uh, culture, which is completely uh, true. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Professor Vago. Yes, indeed. Um, um, I hope uh, Mr. Robi Robert Klein, uh, who may put one of those questions, and Mickey Koren, the other uh, follower, our followers are uh, uh, satisfied with your answers. Um, for Professor Michman. Maybe before you ask my question, I'll add something to what uh, uh, Professor Vago said, and that is a more general uh, picture that many other war criminals were not, not put on trial in, in many countries, and because of all kinds of local situations. For instance, in, in Belgium, in Belgium, the king stayed in Belgium and even met Hitler and so on. He was not a Nazi or pro-Nazi, but he did not lead resistance and so on. And, uh, and in a way, he was a collaborator. And yet, there's, and the, the, what they called uh, afterwards, uh, la question royale, uh, to keep, to keep uh, a royal house, yes or not? The royal house keeps Belgium together between Flanders and and uh, uh, Valonia, Valonia. So they decided not to delve into this problem and keep the royal house. So there was no there was no trial. There were everybody. Uh, 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 related to is as a, as a hot potato and ran away, and so you have these kinds of situations in many other countries also, and it is <clears throat> from the perspective, of course, of uh, of moral uh, moral it is uh, is a problem. But uh, these were other times. Right. Thank you for completing, uh, Professor Michman. You have your own two questions from. Mickey Koren, why Antonescu in the Old Kingdom of Romania didn't establish ghettos? And another question, why the Jews from Basarabia and Bukovina were treated in a different way faced to the Jews from the Old Kingdom of Romania? Um, okay. Um...
I wrote it down in order not to forget. Yes. Uh, and uh, so regarding the first question, uh, it is is not entirely uh, correct to say that the issue of ghettos was not discussed by Antonesco. Um, for instance, I'm opening my own book that's helping my memory. Uh, in uh, He stated on, um, what is it, at uh, uh, a, 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 a quite early period, beginning of the 1940s, uh, were were times uh, normal i would deport them the jews all en masse from the country beyond its borders i cannot do that today uh, and then he proposes he raises the issue of a ghetto right uh, it is not it does not materialize um, but that is already before the beginning of uh, Barbarossa, of the invasion of the Soviet Union. Of course, after afterwards, uh, things escalate uh, very fast, and there is also the um, uh, envoy of Eichmann in Romania, Gustav Richter, who speaks to Antonesco, and so so. And there is even in the summer of ninety. Uh, 1941, uh, there is a person whose name I could not find, but there is a report that he went to the Warsaw Ghetto to see, to learn uh, how ghettos look like, right? And uh, so there is a discussion in uh, the, uh, uh, at the level of the highest Romanian authorities about ghettos. And then uh, and then in August, it is raised again. And when uh, the deportations to Transnistria uh, happen and are carried out, the term at least is used for many places in Transnistria. Uh, why the attitude to uh, the Jews of Bukovina and Bessarabia is different than uh, those in the Old Kingdom? Uh, yes, that is an issue for understanding uh, Romanian nationalism, right? And we have we have similar situations also in several other countries, who uh, in countries that were uh, allies of Nazi Germany but not occupied, and not and they still kept their in, independence. Uh, that their their own attitudes they they apply anti-Semitic rules, but uh, they make a differentiation between our Jews and the other Jews who were annexed in the next uh, territories or so on, or refugees and so on. And um, uh, that, uh, <clears throat> and therefore, uh, there is this attitude uh, towards Romani older Romanian Jews, who was not very positive, but uh, did not overlap with, let's say, ethnic cleansing, right? And, and for the other Jews, uh, they didn't live here, they are not part of Romanian culture, they don't speak Romanian, so uh, let's dispose of them. So that is the general attitude, and um, even in France, for instance, we can see a difference of attitude towards the Israelite, the old, uh, the, the veteran Jews in France versus Eastern European Jews, among them also from Romania, who arrived during the 20th century. Uh, and uh, if I even may uh, give another example from the Netherlands in, uh, uh, in uh, Amsterdam on the 25th of February, 1941, there was a strike against the Germans organized or initiated by the by the Communist Party, but joined by many all over and the whole of city of Amsterdam uh, got on strike, it's something unheard of in any other uh, country under German occupation. Now, one of the slogans of the demonstrators was filthy Germans keep off your filthy hands from our filthy Jews. 
right? <laughs> so, so this, uh, so even in a quite liberal country and so on, you had uh, this attitude. We, we, uh, they are our filthy Jews, right? So we will do with them, not you. And this difference, uh, different uh, attitude, we can find in uh, in other countries too. And I think this explains to to a large extent also the the attitudes to, towards uh, 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 Jews who had not a long-standing uh, Romanian ancestry and citizenship. Wow! Thank you very much, Professor Michman. Uh, we. We still have a lot of questions and comments, but we are running out. We ran out of time already a few tens of minutes ago. So uh, I will just um, overlook uh, the questions. Josef Afni is in, insisting with a question, which I don't think it, it is a question. It is an issue of writing a novel. Uh, Please uh, give us uh, examples of life and suffering of the Jews uh, uh, who were gathered in ghettos in like Bistrica and uh, Târgu Mureș. Uh, okay, examples. I I think uh, I think Serena Adler's comment uh, can can be an answer to Josef Af Afni's request uh, she says if we allow to read her comment i would like to mention that my father otto adler who had then his family beginning beginning of who had then his family beginning of shoah they were escorted to the bricks factory karamidarie on the 3rd of may 1944. I think it's about Cluj, if I'm not wrong. Yes, yes. The ghetto in Cluj was in this factory, Fabrica de Caramida. My father celebrated his 15th anniversary on 4th of May. It was his first, first day in this horrible uh, World War II. World, World War II. And um, this is this is an example of of a victim who perished uh, uh, in in one of those ghettos. Mainly, the ghettos in northern Transylvania were were uh, established in brick factories, at least in Cluj, yeah. in Târgu Mureș, right, Professor Vago? Yes, exactly. Uh, anyway. Not in not only there, but close all, to all the over. railway stations. Yes. Yeah, all over in Hungary, it's it's a, a weird phenomenon. But brick factories were were often used as ghettos. Ghettos in in Hungary are short lived, are for several weeks, uh, except for Budapest, of course. But uh, and so it was improvised. It happened very fast, and apparently because the brick factories were at uh, at the, the in the suburb or outside the city, it was the uh, the, the the most apparent place to to uh, use them as as a ghetto in Hungary. And, and were... also because those factories were close to the railway, uh, this was an important. Yeah. Uh, uh, criteria to yeah, right. put them quickly in the wagons. Yeah, that's right. Well, I uh, want to thank to everybody who was with us uh, and put questions and uh, followed us. Dan Romashkanu, uh, Miki Koren, uh, Robbie Klein, uh, and uh, Josef Afni, Serena Adler, and many, many others. Uh, I want to thank to our followers on the Facebook page of the Romanian Culture Institute and on the official YouTube channel. Today we had a very interesting conference about the Holocaust in Romania, in Northern Transylvania and uh, Romania, uh, together with the uh, 
three lecturers, Nina Zilberman, president of Darbut Foundation from SIGET, uh, Professor Rafael Vago from Tel Aviv University, and Professor Dan Michman from Yad Vashem uh, Institute. Thank you very much. Next week, we will have again a uh, Romanian cafe, Cafe Neua Romanesca, uh, here uh, on the Facebook page of the Romanian Cultural Institute, exceptionally not uh, on Thursday, but on Wednesday, because Thursday is uh, Shevot. So uh, see you on Wednesday before Shevot, Wednesday afternoon, five o'clock if I'm not wrong. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Professor Vago. Thank you, Professor Michman. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. And also the staff of the Romanian Cultural Center who are so helpful in their correspondence and organization and you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank Good you. evening to everybody. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.